Hey everybody, it's Lenilla Wara. Great to be with you this morning uh, and, and hope you're all safe and well in these uh, interesting times that we're living in and I hope those, uh, there's opportunities bubbling up for you to um, for the gospel to soak through you uh, and to leak out all over the place on others uh, in, uh, in different ways perhaps to what we were used to months ago. Give a shout out to Kim and Gary Baker. I hope you're doing well there and sure everybody else uh, there. I hope you're enjoying Kim and Gary's company. Great people to have around. I wanted to talk today about a couple of things. Uh, thank you first of all for your engagement in Dayton over a number of years now and for getting out there every year to run a kids program uh, and to get to know people there and to be part of their ministry and I'm here to get to know one another um, a whole lot better at the same time. And usually those two things happen together, don't they? As we serve God, we grow ourselves. Thanks also for your ongoing interest in Showers of Blessing, uh, building wells in Zimbabwe. And I'm going to talk about those two things uh, right at the end. Before that, I'm going to do a little bit of an overview of Global Mission Partners. I'm going to have a look at a different project, a South Sudan project, and a particular person in that program. And, uh, and then have a look at the man born blind, the story from John nine and what that might teach us uh, about what we see in South Sudan uh, as well as Dayton and as well as Zimbabwe. So let's pray as, uh, as we begin that little journey together. Loving and gracious God, thanks for uh, the opportunity of this time and we pray that your spirit would speak uh, and that uh, we'd each um, hear clearly uh, and uh, know how to respond to be part of your mission in the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So from here on, I'm going to come to you from this little box down the bottom. So as I said, let's start with uh, just three points about global mission partners. And so here's the global one. Uh, Australian Churches of Christ, so people all over Australia getting together uh, to get involved in God's mission in these 10 or so places around the world. Maybe it's 11 now. And you can see that's happening in different colours. Uh, yellowy orange and an orange yellow, uh, green and a red and a brown. So what are those things about? Well, this is, uh, I guess, what we think is uh, uh, involved in our mission. So um, the orangey yellow bit is church partnerships. So that's uh, evangelism, church planting, and training people in those things. The green part is relief and development, uh, cocoa that many of you know, uh, community projects like water and health uh, and livelihoods. Uh, the brown one there is our indigenous ministry and Dayton's part of that. And that's why that one was in Australia. Uh, and the last one doesn't quite match. The blue here is our community of young people. Uh, that's called Embody, and that's about engaging youth and young adults in mission around the world. Uh, and the red one that you did see on the map is actually an emergency program. And the current one uh, that's on the map there is Cyclone Harold in Vanuatu. Uh, and we're working on helping people out in that situation. So uh, that's our mission. It's a holistic mission, um, a mission both in word and deed, uh, and a mission both here and there, here in Australia and around the world. And finally, uh, Global Mission Partners, the partnership, port, uh, partnership part is particularly important to us. We like to think that we know the locals. And so in all of those places around the world is someone who lives there uh, and someone who's involved in Churches of Christ, who's ministering uh, in God's name and with our support. Uh, and so rather than send people who look like me uh, and get them to try and learn the culture and uh, learn the language, uh, we're working with people who know both of those both the culture and the language already uh, and live there and can't get thrown out by the government uh, and invested in that place and we want to invest with them. So that's Global Mission Partners. So now we're going to switch to South Sudan and to this young man whose name uh, is Garang. You can see him here uh, quite relaxed and happy with his mates uh, all in their green school uniforms. They had a good meal for lunch uh, and they've been at school uh, around in the morning. So if you ask Garang, why is it that all of those things are actually 
supported by people in Australia, that green uniform that you've got there, the teachers that you've been listening to, uh, and indeed the lunch that you've had. Why, why do all those things have to come from Australia? He might give you a couple of answers. He might say, well, my grandfather hasn't got much money. He might say, well, the government hasn't got much money. He might say, well, it's really, it's because of the fighting. Uh, and he'd be right with those three answers uh, and a few more besides. His grandfather hasn't got much money. He's living with his grandfather because his, uh, his father has been killed in the wall, just like all of his mates there. Uh, and grandpa doesn't have much money because there's not the fertility uh, in the soil there, or indeed that there's not really the methodology to make the most of that fertility. And so you can see here someone uh, ploughing, showing me how you plough by hand. You get down on your knees uh, and you dig with this long stick with a bit of metal on the end of it. Uh, you need to do it straight after it rains uh, so that the ground's soft and you need to do as much as you can in three days because after three days the ground's going to go hard again. The government doesn't have much money. That was his uh, second reason there. Uh, and uh, this is uh, our team leader there, Paulina Malau, negotiating with the Department of Education and encouraging them to support the teachers' wages of our school. Uh, this is a couple of years ago now and we're still working, campaigning the government to take some responsibility for teachers' wages. And indeed the government hasn't got much money. The main reason be, uh, really for that is the fighting. South Sudan has been in conflict pretty much all of its history. You can see there for independence in 1958, then they had two Sudanese civil wars and in 2011 South Sudan became independent from Sudan. Of course that was a war as well. Uh, and then about two years later the president Salva Kerr and the vice president Rick Mascher started fighting with each other and so there's been a civil war again since that time. So people like the two in this picture are quite common about the place and as you can imagine a lot of money goes into the war rather than into the school and the hospital and the roads and so on. So there's this uh, tribal political conflict right uh, at the as one of the roots of what's going on there. And you can see that the, the two rivals are here. So it's um, Kerr in the hat and Michelle opposite him. Uh, and the encouraging thing is that the church has been part of trying to bring those two guys together. So if you are a development person, you might try and kind of map all this on a little diagram or put a problem tree like that. Why is there no school? Of course, the father's been killed. Why has the father been killed? Because there's a war. Why is there a war? Because of tribal and political jealousy. Why is there no school? Well, there are not a lot of resources. Of course, the, the trees have been knocked down and the soil is not as rich as it used to be. Well, because there's fighting over the oil resources and that's because there's greed. And if you think about this little diagram theologically, you can trace it all the way back uh, and think about where it starts. So, what do we do as Christians in a, an environment like this when there's so many things going wrong? Where do you start? Well, we started in a couple of places. We started by building the school uh, and uh, training and supporting the teachers, providing uniforms and lunch at a manual school. All these kids without, pam without family, without fathers or mothers. Uh, we also worked on the fertility uh, and so in places where people were ploughing by hand we've brought in uh, ox drawn ploughs and trained people to use them uh, and in, in most cases people get something like eight times as much harvest. You can harvest for a ho you can um, plough for a whole lot longer than three days when you've got an ox to draw your plough. Uh, you can get uh, the right depth and a consistent depth in your soil and so you get a much better return, something like eight times the number of groundnuts that you can see here, this gentleman enjoying. And we've also tried to work on that kind of deeper level of peace building. This is a um, conference of community leaders, uh, encouraging them to uh, connect with people from different tribal groups uh, and to learn ways to solve conflicts without violence. This one ran just before 
uh, the most recent peace accord and that peace accord has held for something like 18 months, two years. And so our guys who ran this were very excited to be part of bringing peace in South Sudan. So what's that got to do with the man born blind? Well, let's have a look at the story. And I'd invite you to, um, to pick a character here, pick a colour, uh, and try and think about how that character sees Jesus uh, and how that character responds in this story. The story goes like this. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. I must do the works of him who sent me. Who are we? Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who'd formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, it only looks like him. I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. The man called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and then I could see. Where is this man? I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. This man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But how can a sinner perform such signs? They were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He is a prophet. They still did not believe they had been born blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? Is this the one who was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know that he is as our son uh, and we know that he was born blind. But how he can see, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. And uh, you just ask him. He is of age uh, and he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A little while later, Jesus heard that, he had been that they had thrown him out and he found him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. So I hope you were thinking about the particular character that you, uh, that you picked at the start of that Bible reading and thinking about how that uh, group or person responded. Here are the, um, the neighbours and friends of the man. How did they respond? Well, I would say they responded pretty normally. They wanted to check it out. Are you really the guy that we saw begging? Uh, and they were amazed. This is surprising. This is amazing. How can this possibly happen? How can someone be who has been uh, born blind see again? Hasn't been heard of. If you pick the disciples, they responded in quite a different way. Their question, of course, was, well, whose sin is this? Uh, this man or his parents to cause his condition? These are the Bible students who are trying to work it out theologically. Why did this happen? And, and uh, we've got to have a bit of sympathy for them because they've got some grounds for thinking this way. Certainly, Old Testament has, has parts in it which talks about 
things being visited on the third and the fourth generation. And also the rabbinical teaching that they would have absorbed said things like what's on your screen here. There is no death without sin and there is no suffering without iniquity. And so there was this, um, so this very direct connection between sin and suffering. If you sin, you'll be suffering. So therefore, if you're suffering, you must have sinned. Now, sometimes that happens, doesn't it? Like if you gossip about someone uh, and then uh, they get mad at you or distance themselves from you, there's a pretty clear cause and effect relationship between your sin uh, and the suffering of being ostracized or scolded yourself. But when someone's born blind, uh, or indeed has, a, has any kind of disability from birth, it's a little bit harder to connect the two together. But it's something that we try and do quite a lot. Try and think of the kind of people in our community or the times where we do this, where we blame people who are suffering, where we blame refugees for their predicament or blame people who are unemployed for their predicament or indeed are tough on people with a disability uh, because somehow we think it must be their fault or their responsibility at least. The other group that has a particular reaction are the Pharisees. Well, they kind of have two reactions. One is, wow, he's healed somebody. He must be from God. Uh, the other is, oh, he's breaking the Sabbath. That proves he is not from God. So directly opposite uh, kind of conclusions. But it seems that it's really this, the second group that, that dominates, uh, that breaking the Sabbath proves he is not from God. They've got this idea that holiness only happens uh, within the parameters that they have defined. You can only uh, heal people, or maybe you can't heal people at all, but you certainly can't do it on a Sabbath day because God wouldn't operate so out of the box like that. Uh, God needs to work within our rules. And you might like to think of what kind of people think like that these days that have a particular picture of how God works uh, and can't really see God working any other way. Uh, so there's three groups, uh, the neighbours and the friends who just surprised, uh, the disciples who go, well, let's work this out theologically, what's the reasons behind this, and the Pharisees who are concerned about healing on the Sabbath, perhaps even more than that, they're concerned about their power base being eroded and someone disrupting their way of doing things. And I'm sure you can think of lots of people today that operate in that kind of way. So how does Jesus respond uh, to all this? He, he doesn't blame. He doesn't go down the disciples' track of, well, was it the, his sin, his parents' sin, maybe it was the generation before that. He doesn't really engage in that question at all. He doesn't spiritualize the thing. He doesn't say, look, mate, don't worry about your blindness. It'll all be really good in heaven and you'll see everything. Just hang on till then. But you can think, probably think of some people these days that spiritualize everything. He didn't say it was a conflict of interest. He didn't say, look, it's a Sabbath. You'll need to come back on Sunday. I'll give you a ticket. We'll, um, we'll make an appointment uh, and you can get healed then. And he didn't get lost in this physical, spiritual dilemma of saying, well, you look, it's only blindness. What you really need to do is get your spiritual life straight uh, and the blindness will kind of fade away. He acted there and then. He got his fingers dirty. He got his hands in the mud and did something about this person's immediate condition. He didn't go off on any of those tangents. He saw this as an opportunity for the grace of God to be seen in this man. An opportunity. A place where God can step in. And I want to encourage you that uh, when you look at someone like Garang there that we started with, that you too see them as an opportunity. An opportunity for God's grace to step into Garang's life and indeed into your own as you respond uh, in uh, compassion and solidarity with him. Now, I, uh, I went to a, a seminar hmm, a couple of years ago now, run by some Christian people who work with people with a disability. 
And so it was interesting to think how they resolve this dilemma of, well, who's, whose sin is this? What's caused of this person to be blind or to have some other disability? Their take was quite different from the disciples and indeed uh, the others in the story. Uh, their understanding was that God has put people with a disability into our communities as an opportunity for God's grace to step in, as an opportunity for the goodness of God to be shown, a way of helping us uh, to learn to love even more. And so when you, when you th think of healing, um, we think of a new form of holiness. Um, I just wanted, I just wanted to, to make the point that uh, the, these stories of healing, uh, of all those healing stories in the Gospels, uh, the most common one is actually uh, uh, stories of people who are blind being healed. And in about half of those stories, there is also a story of that person coming to faith as there is in this one. Uh, Jesus steps in and heals this person. It's actually uh, probably a few days later at least that he catches up with him uh, and indeed that man responds to Jesus in faith. So Jesus is willing to take the risk, note, of stepping in and doing something really practical with no guarantee, if you like, of some spiritual change but he's really wanting that man to be whole in every way. And indeed, that's our desire at, at GMP, and that's why at the start you can see all the different facets of our ministry, wanting to put the, uh, people in touch with Jesus and put people in touch with the real help that Jesus offers in every dimension of their life. So I just put in this slide here of Paulino, uh, the guy that you saw in the Department of Education office, actually got the same uh, pinky shirt on, uh, here he is baptising someone in uh, one of the rivers in South Sudan there. Holiness. Making people whole in the way that Jesus wanted each, wants each of us to be. So when you look at uh, your friends in Dayton, here for you is opportunity. An opportunity for God's grace to step in uh, and to make change in their lives and to make change in your own an opportunity for there to be a safe place for kids to come to after school, a supportive place that encourages them with positive values and gives them some really practical help. The good news is that now we've, um, we've got the money to go ahead and buy the community centre and that will give uh, great stability to that, um, that ministry there and create a whole lot new of new opportunities. I'm probably telling you things that you know because uh, I'm excited that you're the experts in Dayton already. And there's Brendan, great to have a pastor and a community, um, a community worker working together on the ministry there, responding to people's need to know Jesus and their need to be helped in really practical ways and seeing those two things as very much tied together. An opportunity for God's grace uh, to step in. So I want to now just um, draw you back to um, Zimbabwe uh, and let you look at a video about a way to help out with the water situation in Zimbabwe. More than ever, we can see how vital safe water, hygiene and sanitation are for everyone. Globally, one in 10 people still don't have clean water close to home. Let's, Let's do, do something, something about, about it. it. This September, challenge yourself and change someone's life for the better. Drink nothing but water for the entire month and raise funds to give people access to safe water. You can still eat as normal, but no coffee, no tea and no drinks other than water. Safe water improves health and hygiene and helps to stop the spread of disease. With long-term development of water projects, kids can stop missing school, women and girls can be empowered and whole communities can be transformed. Drink just water to give water. Join our community around Australia who are making a real difference. Visit safewatersepember.org.au Sign up now to find out how your challenge can change someone's life. Make a real impact. Every person deserves safe water. So thank you. 
opportunity for God's grace to step in. In South Sudan, in Dayton, and thank you guys for stepping in there. And I really want to encourage you to keep it up, keep up um, your visits over there and encouraging the Wollongong guys to get involved as well. And really going to encourage your financial support of them as well. Thanks for the barbecues that you do and the energy that you put into that. And uh, also for uh, Zimbabwe, I really want to challenge you to engage in a Safe Water September to find uh, five people who are who are keen to take it on and for others uh, to support them and to sponsor them. God's uh, grace stepped into a man who was born blind, um, not because it was his fault. Jesus put away all those ideas of blame, all those boundaries of whether it was the right day or whether spiritual or physical things are what Jesus is about or what Christianity is about. He stepped in and saw the opportunity, took the opportunity to allow God's grace to be seen in that man. I want to encourage you to do the same. May God bless you as you try and do that in all sorts of situations.